So Sandrine, another year, another climate negotiations, or COP um, as they're called. Um, you've been to a lot, I've been to a lot. Yeah. But there's a real sense of emergency now, isn't there? Urgency. We've had the IPCC, the, the sort of body of international scientists, tell us we've got 12 years to halve emissions. But then there doesn't feel like a sense of emergency in the negotiations. I mean, what, what's wrong? What's missing? I think what's missing is that actually people now are the ones that are calling out and indicating that there is this sense of urgency. We've seen, obviously, the Extinction Rebellion. We've seen also that's climate, a little, that's and that's a little the logo little logo that wearing. I have yeah. here. Okay. Um, very much supportive of the Extinction Rebellion and what it stands for, actually launched by one of my very good friends. Okay. A woman who is trying to bring citizens together, like we've heard from many others who are starting to say enough is enough. And we've um, been talking about this for too long. And we've seen this in London. So this, yes. is, this is people occupying bridges mm -hmm. and streets. Um, We've seen in Australia school children going on strike from school, much to the um, disgust of uh, Australia's Prime Minister. Uh, anywhere else? We're starting to see the same movement in the United States. Um, I think we might see an action here as well, either today or tomorrow. Wow, okay. Which fits in nicely with what we've been calling for at the Club of Rome. As the new co president of the Club of Rome, several of us and mostly thought leaders who have been working in this area for many, many years. Some of our members actually were original members of the Club of Rome in 1968. So we've got a member who's 90 years old. Wow. And, and they have always indicated that we cannot continue to grow in the same way that we've been growing. That we need to reevaluate first our indicators of growth, but also take into consideration the natural planetary boundaries that we have and the resources that we have to try to minimize our impact on the globe. Yet, you know, the governments and their negotiators meeting here can't even welcome the science report they themselves commissioned. Yeah. So I think there's only four. So I, what tends to happen is that the media blows this out of proportion. I was speaking to the European Commission yesterday and other delegations who feel pretty confident that first of all, the IPCC report has been mentioned before and it will be mentioned by the end of this week. I think there are more important things that we need to discuss. I think we need to think a little bit about what are the other barriers that we're starting to see? Some of the social barriers, everyone's talking about the gilets jaunes yep. and the issues that are happening in France right now. We're not doing a good enough job of bringing people on the journey. So on the one hand, we've got the Extinction Rebellion and citizens who are saying, time's up. And on the other hand, we've got other citizens who are saying, I can't continue to pay for my heating. I can't continue to be one of the energy poverty victims. I can't continue to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is not just a Brazilian or a Peruvian or a Russian. It's a European. This is all, I mean, it's ordinary people who already and will suffer more from climate change and, and the other, and us hitting our planetary boundaries, you know, for things like water and food and everything else. And of course, the natural reaction is to kick back against, you know, existing structures like the European Union. Yeah. You, you've been doing some work on how to sort of bring Europe together, mm -hmm. modernize. Is that the European Union or, or Europe as a, as a That's idea? Europe more broadly. And I must say that I'm a real fan. First of all, my husband's English. Yes. But the fact of the matter is that having worked with His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales and being a senior associate and having worked with Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, for many years, in fact, we came to these COPs together with Britain with the European Union working as a whole. And we have to remember that actually the UK has always been a progressive leader in the area of climate. We worked together in terms of most of the foreign affairs and the embassy messaging yeah. that was going on around the Climate Act. And to see that actually now we're going to start talking about a Europe which is split, yeah. a Europe which no longer functions as one leader is saddening for me. Well, and the truth is that Europe's been, a, sorry, UK, has been a global leader yes. because of its ability Absolutely. to drive European climate policy. Absolutely. And, and do you think that's it, it's going to struggle to find that place globally now? I outside? think it may. I mean, I've seen it physically in terms of also the messaging that's going out to the embassies. Um, as I said, the UK embassies were our greatest friends in terms of passing on the message, in terms of bringing business leaders together with the Prince of Wales and other actors, NGOs, the finance community, to try to unlock and unpack some of the barriers to climate change. We had fantastic workshops across Europe in the Central and Eastern European countries and in Southern Europe, and this was all led by the UK. 
So to see now this split is, is very discouraging. I think what's interesting as well, when we take a step back from the climate conversation, we need to realize also that there are many other conversations happening at the same time. And we tend to forget that these pressure points, or what I call these tipping points, yep. are happening. We've got the future of work, and this is part of the project you were mentioning around yes. Europe Delivers. The future of work is actually creating a great malaise for some people who feel that obviously they're not going to be able to transition, whether it be towards digitalization or whether it be towards new energy sources. Yep. So the coal industry obviously is, is part of that issue as we transition into what does the future of work for them look like? But also, what does the future of work look like in terms of that AI digitalization aspect? And I think what's really interesting there is then you bring in the social contract, you yeah. bring in the social implications. So is this, is this this idea of a, a just transition? I mean, whether it's in a climate context or a technological context, that you know we're, we're going to transition. I mean, that's inevitable. Either climate's going to force us or clean technology is scaling up and costs are coming down. But how do you ensure that people are not discarded along the way and bring them yeah. you know, in a way that gives them a better life, a better future? Absolutely. And I think the problem, again, is the just transition has been hijacked a little bit by the coal industry and, and that very important need right now to figure out how we bring the coal industry along on the clean energy revolution. But it's much broader than that. Um, and what I've found, which is very interesting in the work that we've been doing on the future of work, is that people are just as uncomfortable with the shift from the deep social contract that you could have with your employer, yeah. and now the flexibility that many young people want. What, how, how do we actually ensure that all of those people that are in some of those services jobs or independence and who are creative and doing other things and want that flexibility yeah. also have a social contract? How do we ensure that they still get the right wages? How do we also bring in people that in some ways are not actually no. part of the system, of the work system? So there are many deep conversations that we need to have. You're having that at the same time that you're having the conversation on climate. You're having that at the same time that you're having the conversation around competitiveness in Europe and the outside world. Yep. All of these things need to be talked about at the same time. So it's a series of tipping points that are converging into a great deal of yep. questioning for Europe. I mean, you, you heard David Suzuki, um, the Canadian you know, TV presenter and climate advocate in Oslo at the event we were both yes. at, talk about the sense of urgency. And I did a video with him and he's quite pessimistic about, you know, where we are and what we've got to achieve. I mean, do you share that pessimism or it, are we going to get there? It's hard because I'm innately an optimist <laughs> and, I'm, I'm not, and I'm not necessarily a pessimist. But I must say, I started to reflect a little bit on my own history. And although I'm younger than David Suzuki, I've started to realize that I've spent the entire 30 years of my career working on climate sustainability yeah. and Europe. In fact, I started as a, as a stagiaire, an intern in the European Commission. And to see the, the sense of crisis that we're under, um, I, I do get slightly pessimistic. Do, do you think ordinary people out there, it's been communicated to them, the urgency has been communicated to them clearly? Do you think they, because I, I, again, did one of these videos with the US climate scientist, uh, Michael Mann. Mm. We were in the Arctic and it was, you know, he, he talked about the, war, the warming in the Arctic and how it's already impacting weather around the world. The heat yeah. waves we've seen, the wildfires, the hurricanes, and superstorms. Uh, do, do you think that penny is is dropped in the in the public consciousness yet? I don't think it's dropped in the public consciousness, and I don't think it's dropped in the political consciousness. I don't think anybody realized just the sense of urgency that we're under and the need to put in place an emergency plan. I mean, I am I am the second generation of of Europeans, Belgians who actually were part of the war. My grandparents actually fought in the war. My yep. grandfather was yep. a resistance fighter and actually was in a concentration yep. camp for three years. And they knew how important the European project was. Yes. But in addition to that, they also knew that sometimes you need to hunker down. And I think what we haven't been able to communicate to people is hunkering down is okay. That's not a bad thing. We can go into a sense of emergency by putting in place the right management plans, both in terms from the climate perspective, adaptation yep. and mitigation, and hopefully we can come through that 
emerge into a renaissance that actually is much more creative, much more innovative, much more focusing on the good things, the, the, the reason why we're all here, yeah. which is to live properly, but not live extremes. And I think yeah. our consumption, our need to live these extremes continuously, yeah. that's not healthy either. Well, those generations, I think, you know, my great grandparents in World War One and, and grandparents and uncles in World War Two. I think part of what drove them was they were doing this for their children and, and grandchildren. And, but do you think we still have that sense of doing things for the future generations? I don't think we do, and I, and I think this is the problem. I think this individualism and the desire to preserve oneself over a broader good is a real problem. So how do we recover that? I mean, I, mean, I guess that's part of what the Extinction Rebellion yeah. is about. Yeah. And, and, in the, and the school children who are going on yeah. strike, I mean, actually, it's not even about their future, it's about their own future. It's funny because I think there, again, there are these counter tensions, right? I think that our generation, some of our generation and the older generation are the incumbents and they're holding on to what they have. In fact, when you look at our generation, what did we do? We went out and got our first car. Yeah. We made sure actually that we were economically able to have our first house. Most of our, I mean, my children aren't even thinking that way. Right. They're taking public transport. I have one daughter who doesn't even have her license yet. And the other one who's trying, but she's 25, and it's not a big deal. Yeah. They're living in a totally different world. Both of them are upcycling, they're recycling, they sell their things online. They don't buy in the same way either. Well, and a lot so of I the things they want, shift. yeah, they, a lot of the things that they want are virtual. I mean, they're, yes. not, they're not physical and tangible. Yes. Um, and, and a lot of their life is, is on, you know, is online. Um, they don't even need to go physically and be with their friends. They can be with their friends in their bedrooms, I guess. Or at least, you know, fortune. Which for, comes those of us back who are fortunate to your original in the West. A question, and this is where I, I, again, I think that there are these counter tensions that are really hard to rectify. So on the one hand, we have the shared economy. Yeah. We have the possibility of being virtual, of actually decreasing our impact. But in another way, it's also increasing our impact because we know, for example, that blockchain is incredibly energy intensive. We know that the IT sector is incredibly energy intensive. Yeah. We also know that the social implications, yeah. the fact that we have one of the highest rates of depression we've ever yeah. had, that people are feeling totally disenfranchised yeah. from reality, the bullying that also yeah. happens. Yeah. So on the one hand, it's positive. On the other hand, we, it's, it's deeply, difficult yeah. and we need to think about how do we actually bring people back yeah. into the real world yeah those same techn I mean there are some versions of blockchain which now that are much less carbon intensive because like yes. people respond and it could have a major transformation um, so just to sort of I think you know come to a sort of conclusion here if there were three key messages you could put out there in the world you know what would they be I think the, the first message is don't be frightened of emergency. Yeah. Um, I saw my family rebuild after the war and it was beautiful um, if I look at the history. So emergency can give birth to emergence, yeah. a better emergence, a stronger emergence of civilization and putting us back to a value system that really is much more in tune with who we are and how we actually fit within yeah. our planetary boundaries. The second I would say is let's look though at those other challenges. Don't blame climate for all of the shifts that we need to make in society. Yep. There's the future of work, there's the social contract, and politicians need to take that into account. And the third is we need to be real. I'm so sick of fake facts. I'm yep. so sick of untruths. Yep. Look at Brexit, I'm sorry. But to fa the fact that they were able to announce, both Farage and Johnson the next day, that actually they weren't telling all the truth. And the people accept that? We and can't there accept was, that there anymore. There was no outrage. There I mean, was where, no where outrage. Where was the outrage? How is that you know? possible? Yes. I and I think that's the beauty of the Extinction Rebellion. The Extinction Rebellion is saying, we the people want to take back our planetary boundaries. We want to take back control of this yeah. world. We want to stop being lied to. Yeah. And that's fundamentally very important. Well, I think that was, you know, many people, I guess there's that feeling, whether it's the some of the demonstrations in France or the huge march, you know, for people's vote in the UK and, and uh, you know. And 65,000 Belgian citizens just before the car yeah. who took to the streets yes. and said enough is enough. When the women's marches, I mean, it's, it's people wanted to take back democracy. Yes. Um, but we're yes. trying to work out how do you, 
how do we do that? I mean, it's almost like we need a reboot, don't we? A renewal, we a reboot we, we do. of our systems, yeah. our democracy. Um, not to have less democracy, yeah. but, but more. More democracy, better democracy, real democracy, because just being able to say what you yeah. think, like we're saying yeah. with Trump, is not enough. And real facts. I mean, <clears> real know. facts. And also, let's move away from this, this, this hatred. Yeah. Um, this this venous uh, spitting out of of hate, which but, really drives me around the bed. But isn't that? I mean, humans tend to go to that place when they're scared. It's it's fear talking, mm. and I guess we have to address that fear. Um, yeah. And I, you know, and that's critical. Well, it's interesting because I I've been tweeting and retweeting some very important people. Um, presidents, vice presidents, even his royal highness sometimes. Yep. And sometimes the hate mail that I get and that he or she gets after I've tweeted, I find phenomenal. Yep. You would never say that to a person's face. No. Well, I've experienced, you know. I'm sure, I've personal, and I have as well. Myself, both in climate and in relation to uh, Brexit, sadly. Yeah. But um, anyway, well, look, thank you, Sandrine. You're That's welcome. been an amazing thank conversation. You, For all Remember, the good things you're doing. Well, thank you. Well, likewise. Thank you. Please comment, be part of the Green and Tonic community. We want to hear from you. Um, and of course, as always, subscribe to the channel. Thank you. Thank you.